that are made to um, our treaties. So, Janine, I think we'll just turn it over to you. Okay. Well, thank you, Senator Vogt and uh, Representative Sassia and the members of the committee for inviting me to speak. Um, it's been a, a while, you know, speaking here and uh, very comfortable within the uh, Labor and Commerce Committee room here, so I'm glad that uh, we're residing here today. Um, I'm going to talk for a few minutes, uh, um, and I'm sorry if some of this is uh, information that you already know, because some of you I've presented for before, but we are going to go into a little bit more in depth um, the TPP and uh, TTIP and some of the reviews that we've been doing on various um, products coming out of Maine. Um, for those who don't know the Maine International Trade Center, we were um, created by the legislature in 1996 and under Governor King at the time uh, as a 501c3 with 50% uh, funded through Department of Economic and Community Development and 50% by the private sector. We are membership-based. Um, that's part of the private sector funds that we get in, but we also service any company in the state of Maine that needs our assistance. Um, the other thing I want to highlight is uh, a lot of people think uh, when they go on our website that we're servicing mostly the larger companies in the state of Maine. And the fact is, in terms of our call-ins and our membership, 90% um, of our members are under 75 employees, and 60, around 60 or percent or plus are actually under 25 employees. So we really do represent the small and medium-sized businesses in the state, and those are the businesses that need our help when they're navigating international waters. So that's who we are and uh, how we were created. Um, I'm going to go a little bit of an overview in terms of what Maine's doing and uh, then a, a little bit of information in terms of what are the services that we are providing and then I, I hope that we have some time at the end to maybe uh, do some question and answers. The other thing I, I would like to also um, indicate is that we don't um, set trade policy. Our, we basically take whatever the trade policy is and what the regulations are and help our companies in terms of managing their goods in terms of whether they're exporting or importing or are providing services. So it's really more as an aid to Maine than it is in terms of um, any types of trade policy. Of course, when we have companies that are, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, that have concerns or things like that, we've worked very closely both with the committee through Wade Merritt, who's been representing uh, the Trade Center on the committee, and also our federal delegation. So um, that's kind of the role that we're playing in terms of really helping Maine in, in their global activities. Um, this is just an overview of our of where is Maine exporting in the world. We have about 2.7 billion dollars of product that's uh, exported. Now that's just goods. We don't have really good reporting on services um, by the Department of Commerce, which is where we get our data from the Census Bureau and also through uh, entities that break it down by state. Um, as you can see, Canada by far our number one export uh, partner, uh, representing actually last year was over 39% of our exports. We like to see that number a little bit more diverse. Um, and if you go down the list, you'll see Asia plays a very large role in terms of our top markets now. And so do some of our more traditional markets in the EU, um, such as Netherlands and UK, um, Germany, Italy. So. This is a very different picture than it was 20 years ago, and I think that that's something that we should also be aware of, um, how uh, these different new markets that have come online have definitely um, provided new opportunities and also some really good diversity since Europe has been in a slump for a while and there's um, nobody that's predicting that it's going to turn around immediately. Um, top 10 export commodities, uh, again, no surprises there, paper, seafood, wood products, um, electronic and industrial machinery, um, aircraft parts, um, optics for medical uh, products, 
you know, a number of different areas that Maine has always played a major role in in terms of supply, um, our natural resources, our <coughs> precision manufacturing is still a mainstay of our exports. Um, this is just a quick overview of some of the services that we provide. Um, on the first two that you'll see, trade assistance and trade education, um, those are really our top two services that companies come to us for. Um, we provide over 1,400 uh, market reports, uh, reports on duties, how to get into new markets, all of those what we'd call trade queries that we um, bring in on a yearly basis. And then trade education, really educating Maine's workforce. Um, anytime you have either new people that are uh, new into the trade realm, um, also when trade regulations change, informing them, bringing in experts in the field, um, and also when opportunities come up, when we've got changes, let's say, in additional logistics options or really exciting news that we feel like everybody should know about and start taking advantage of. So those we um, provide throughout the year, and I think those are probably our most important um, of our services for Maine's, um, especially small companies that oftentimes are not able to follow that on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, what we get recognition for in the paper is usually on the trade shows and trade mission side. Um, it's really important to get people out of their seats and get overseas. You know, I can't tell you how challenging that is with our small and medium-sized companies. Even when we are really aggressive going after any kind of export grants we can get through the federal government usually or with partners like Maine MEP, but, or Manufacturing Extension Partnership. I know I won't use acronyms if I can avoid it. Um, but even when you bring the cost down, the biggest, I find the biggest obstacle for main businesses is time. We have so many owner-operated companies and just for them to carve out that time to get out there, oftentimes they don't have an international sales even person. So you're, you're really uh, having to, you know, juggle, is this worth it? You know, how, is, how are we going to do on this export market? And people often will say, well, can you, you know, guarantee that I'm going to get X amount of sales out of this trip? No, but <laughs> I can guarantee you that we're going to vet each company that you're meeting with when we're going on a trade mission or when we do trade shows, we try to match that with matchmaking. So it is worth your while. And then once you can get your foot in the door, it, it makes it a much better process. So we had... Um, Last year, we coordinated at Seafood Expo, which is also known as the Brussels, Brussels Seafood Show, the largest seafood show in the world, also coordinated by a main company, I will say, Diversified Communications. We've done for two years now, and we're going to be going into the third year, the Winter Fancy Food Show. And we're doing that cooperatively with the Department of Agriculture and also Maine Made. And we now have a pavilion. Uh, we went from three companies to six companies to, I believe, we'll have nine companies this year. That's been particularly popular and successful. And what that show allows us to do is get exposure both on the West Coast market, the national market, you know, even though that's not international, we're happy as long as they're getting, you know, con contracts and they're diversifying their customer base. And we set up, um, particularly with a lot of Pacific Rim and Canadian accounts, um, matchmaking for international. And then Medica, we actually organize the um, Best of New England Pavilion. So we get together, medical shows are very expensive, so we get together with the other states and have, you know, basically the effort of, of grouping all together and having a larger presence and bringing down the cost of it. And actually, um, the Maine Trade Center has been the lead on that for the, the last seven years with uh, Zainab Turk on my staff, uh, who's done a great job. On everything that we do that you're seeing there, we benchmark. And you'll see that in the annual reports. You know, how many, how many customers do people meet with? How, what are the projected export sales? Was this worthwhile? And it's part of our whole evaluation process of do we want to continue on and in doing certain shows and are we meeting basically um, Maine's needs? This showed you a little, shows you a little bit of who participated in the uh, Winter Fancy Food Show, which I think um, 
Some of them may be familiar you know, names to you, Gelato Fiasco, Finest Kind Tea, Denny Mike's Barbecue, Todd Salsa, Lucy's Granola, Shuck's Maine Lobster. And um, again, I'd say I'm actually in conversations with um, Commissioner Whitcomb in terms of they want to see if they can model something like that on the East Coast as well. Um, I have to say, even at the show in San Francisco, there are a lot of East Coast buyers. And actually, some of our uh, companies got contracts on the East Coast. And that was kind of curious to us. So we dug in and said, you know, why are you going all, have to go all the way to San Francisco to get a New York buyer? And they said, because we find that a lot of the innovation is going on in the West Coast. And so a lot of the East Coast buyers go there to see market trends as they're starting. So I thought that was a very interesting little uh, tidbit. And again, um, I don't really, and my staff don't care where the, the companies are getting their successes as long as we're helping them, them grow and develop. Um, we do coordinate all of the gubernatorial trade missions. Um, and also, we have smaller industry missions. Um, last year, we did the trade mission to uh, Iceland in the UK. Um, I'll be talking about AIMSKIP a little bit later, but that that's, was part of the um, reason for selecting Iceland, was that we basically now have direct service for most of the North American or Northern European countries, Scandinavia, and um, Iceland, which really up until that point had been sourcing a lot from Europe and paying extraordinary prices. Think of it, it's an island nation of just a little over 350,000 people, but they were buying things second, third hand, so we could have our companies come, sell directly with a direct service, and really get make some inroads. So that was, even though it's a, would, a small market, it was, um, I think it's a very special relationship and offers some really unique opportunities. So some of the companies, even like we never have international paper with us on almost anything, but that was one of those that they were like, this is an interesting niche market we haven't serviced before. Um, we'd like to come with you and get some introductions. Um, Main Electric Boat, we've had a lot of um, connectivity with UNE and the University of Maine, Maine Grains, Portland Shellfish, and uh, Bar Harbor Foods. Um, some of you also may have read in the paper we have this thing called the Maine North Atlantic Development Office, which we started in December of 2013, um, really with almost nothing. Um, that first year, um, that was totally, all the activities were totally funded by private sector companies because it was kind of a test year. Do we have enough market demand? Is there enough to sink our teeth into? And I think that at the end of the day, the answer is absolutely yes. Um, we had a, it all started with um, Aimskip coming into Portland. We had a focus on the North Atlantic and our new connectivity. How do we leverage this? We had President Grimson, the president of Iceland, come and speak at trade day and meet with a number of different groups. And his big pitch, which I think resonated with so many, was, you guys, you know, it's often we say we're at the end of the line, you know, geographically. And that's often ex an excuse that we use in terms of limiting ourselves. And I think that that's an excuse and that Iceland gets quite often, too, because they're <laughs> really at the end of the line. But he said, you know, on all of this Arctic development that's going on, and whether it's geopolitical, whether it's climate change, whether it's opportunities, because there's a lot of development going on, both in Iceland, in Greenland, and in eastern Canada, you're, you are one of the best positioned in the United States. And his challenge to um, both Governor LePage, to the Trade Center, to really the whole audience was, you can either be on the boat or off the boat, but frankly, you know, you're the best positioned you know, on, in the U.S. for all of the activities, Arctic activities, that are going on in the North Atlantic. And um, a lot of people took that to heart. And so that's how the evolution of the North Atlantic Development Office, that's a picture of Dana Eidsness, who um, heads that office, and um, with um, Senator King, who also has embraced these activities and been an um, amazing advocate. And Dana has done a great job in terms of getting us in the door with so many things. 
including <coughs> the Arctic Circle Conference that you'll see that we went to last year. We had two speakers, three speakers from Maine. Um, now Maine's on uh, a number of different workshops, and she's actually on the selection committee. I mean, within a year, she has gotten herself into every major role in terms of Arctic activities. Um, we are part of the North Atlantic Ocean Cluster Alliance. And last year, we did the defense and security show in um, Halifax for the first year, positioning ourselves for Eastern Canada activities. Um, I'm hoping in the next 12 months, you're going to be hearing more about the New England Ocean Cluster House. Um, Again, this is an opportunity that we saw and that um, President Grimson introduced us to that has been uh, a number of different North Atlantic um, countries have taken uh, this model and we're bringing one to Maine in terms of bringing in investors and innovators that can use a lot of marine products for value added usage, whether it's for medical bandages. There's a lot within the medical field and life sciences field that, that it's applicable. And this adds value at the end of the day, what's this, what this has done in Iceland and Norway and a number of different countries and can do here is it's adding value down to the fishermen. So each fish, I mean, it has worth hundreds of times more uh, in value than it is just by using the meat and discarding everything else. So this, we're courting pharma companies, biotech companies, medical products companies, and basically anyone that's using kind of marine resources and uh, fisheries in its supply chain. Um, Study Main, which I think some of you may have um, different uh, academies in your district and colleges in your district that are very involved with us. This is um, about five-year-old program. Wade was one of the initiators of this. We are not alone. There are other states that, that um, have international student attraction. Um, but I think that we're you know, one of the strongest ones, at least in the Northeast, or New England, we'll say, in terms of coordinating this. Pennsylvania does an amazing job with it, I'll, I will add. Um, we were hitting. Um, you know, basically, particularly in the 90s, and then the academies were some of the first to uh, embrace this, really big challenges with declining student enrollments. And you had um, smaller and smaller classes. Um, oftentimes, with some of the academies, they had boarding capacity or homestay capacity, and started really reaching out to international destinations to get more students coming. Um, now we've got the colleges and universities doing it more. It's really something that's developing in Maine, and I think it's really exciting, especially when you, I don't know, I just read in the Portland Press Herald this morning again, like our 65 years up population, you know, expanding in huge numbers and us dwindling in our under 25 and 25 to 60. So this is one of the things that I would say is, has some amazing potential Workforce-wise, population-wise, diversity-wise. I mean, you're coming just to go into some of these pockets of, you know, going to MCI or going to Foxcroft Academy out in Dover, Foxcroft, and you actually see, you know, five different countries represented. That's a pretty neat way of being able to tap into that. And, and as it says um, up here, it adds huge amounts into our co economy, over $70 million in, in a year, and that's just talking about tuitions. So this, I think, is a really um, exciting economic driver, and we've really embraced it in the last couple of years. We not only get some of the schools on trade missions to meet with agents, to meet with overseas schools and start attracting more students, but also having um, their uh, our own education missions, which Kazakhstan, which you would think Kazakhstan it would not be your first point of going to for our students, but the fact is they're sending more and more students to the U.S. So a lot of those schools or some of those schools have been bringing in students from all over the world. So they actually were very excited to diversify and get into uh, Kazakhstan. And that shows you the types of schools who are using Study Maine, Chevrus, Hassan, uh, Lee Academy, Lincoln. Main School of Science and Mathematics, and um, Thomas College. 
about six years ago, we started, and now I know why I'm so crazy busy lately. <laughs> it's been a really um, great uh, growth over the last five or six years and opportunities. And this Invest in Maine program, it started quite small under Governor Baldacci, and then uh, we were able to get an MTI grant to really do some focused cluster development on specific clusters that coordinated with Maine. Um, and this, and then leveraged that, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, with EDA to get a very sizable gr grant allowing us to have an EU office and a Shanghai office. I say office, it's one representative in the office, but it's boots on the ground over there in terms of developing trade leads. Foreign direct investment, which are foreign owned companies in Maine, we have approximately 100. Um, that represents about 30,000 jobs. Um, our top investors are Canada, Switzerland, Germany, and Japan. Um, you'll see some of the recent investments. You'll Systems Log Logistics in Lewiston from Italy, Asahi Kasai, which is in Blue Hill, Ameskip, Molnica in both uh, Wiscasset and Brunswick, Dalagip in Searsport, and GVS Group down in Sanford. And, you know, this investment's coming from all over and going all over in the state of Maine, which I think is very exciting, because I think a lot of people think, oh, investment, it all goes to Portland. Well, frankly, part of it is we're very focused on manufacturing and attracting manufacturers, uh, which plays well with Maine & Company, because they are very, um, if those of you who know Maine & Company, does business attraction on the domestic front and are quite focused on financial services, back office operations, call centers, things like that. So we complement each other very well and we share a lot of our information. And frankly, if I have a back office kind of inquiry, I put it right through to Peter Del Greco at Maine & Company because they do it better than anyone else. Um, and we're working with a number of different um, economic development districts to help them in terms of their foreign direct investment efforts. So la last year, uh, well, we had established the EU office in 2013, but we expanded that uh, into more German operations last year. Uh, this January, we op opened the office in Shanghai. We had over 48 company one-on-one -on -one meetings with potential investors. And we hosted investors from China, Iceland, Ireland, and France. So just summing up in terms of Mitzi operations, um, these are some of the highlights from last year. You know, uh, over $8 million in projected export sales from our participating companies. We had an SBA grant for our uh, exporters, and our ROI <coughs> on that was over 31 to 1, with $6.5 in reported sales. And then scoring the EDA grant for Invest in Maine was huge, and that was that's an $800,000 grant that will cover a three-year period. Very um, aggressive deliverables. So we are we are um, going really full speed in terms of meeting all of those, and so far we're very much on track, um, thanks to Wade and a great great group um, of people. Upcoming events will be in Halifax in September at the Defense and Security <laughs> Show. We have four companies signed up for that. That's helping main companies get um, military contracts mostly in Canada and Canadian partners for that. Composites Europe, which is coming up in Stuttgart. Um, our main composites industry has some of the most wonderful R&D going on at University of Maine, at SMCC um, Searle Lab at, in Brunswick, and is getting some really wonderful recognition. They're going to be coming over with us. The Arctic Circle Assembly coming up in Reykjavik, and uh, the trade mission to Japan and Shanghai, um, Medica show, medical product show in November, and then the fancy food show. So we're going to have a busy fall, and we're going to be in a number of different parts of the world, and those are all going to be between, I would say, three and 20 main entities at various uh, shows and events that you're seeing there on each of those. We basically don't go unless we get the companies to go, because it's really not about us. It's about their success. So, TPP, and I'm going to say that, number one, I am not an expert on TPP or TTIP, 
Um, but I thought I'd like to share the information that we have access to and that if anyone on the committee would like further information on that, we'll help in any way that we can in terms of um, gathering that and providing that to you. Um, basically, if you're looking at what's going to TPP countries, the uh, 11 other countries that they're um, discussing in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, number one, when it says fish and crustaceans, that number is driven highly by lobster exports. Um, mineral fuel and bitumen, um, that, again, we've been looking at that as kind of a pass-through for Maine. Um, wood and paper products definitely are large in terms of the Pacific Rim. Electronics and industrial machinery, um, aircraft parts, edible fruit and nuts, that's, again, uh, driven by blueberries and pulp. So those are, those are some of the, what Maine's sending into those 11 countries in, in particular. And then we dug down a little bit in terms of, okay, for all of our major uh, exports, which ones really have some onerous duties on them? And where we see if there was an FTA, um, are there, are there any economic advantages to main industries with an, an FTA in place? So these are the, I think we had three different countries that specifically looked of interest and um, two of them of some high volume. We export about $70 million of products to Japan. Um, a lot of that will, we have um, frozen blueberries very well, well valued as an antioxidant and for health properties. We've had a few of our major blueberry exporters that have really focused on Japan in the last 20 years. Um, their tariffs are running between 6 and 9.6 percent. Our biotech industries, it's been, again, building, um, and it runs at a, about a 3 percent tariff, which doesn't seem like much, but some of these guys are working on very small margins, so a 3% can make or break uh, a deal compared to Europe or whoever else they're going up against. Generally, it's um, Europe versus U.S. on the biotech. Uh, container bags, I'm not quite sure if this is, these are our friends over in the uh, Lewiston Auburn area, but I have a, a, a sneaky suspicion there are a couple of uh, people that are making these um, particular textile ma manufactured bags that are used for a number of different um, corrosive industries. And that's running at around 8%. And lobster, Japan, the tariff is not huge, although the 5%, again, um, gets very large when you're talking about high dollar value items. This one always um, surprises me, but I think that it's definitely, I've talked to a few of the boat builders. It's like selling coal to Newcastle, but the New Zealand is known for its sailing fleets and for its yacht making, and yet they still like to buy our yachts and our boats. So that, those, those guys, and I know that um, I've talked to uh, both Hinkley and Sabre, and uh, actually even with Hodgdon Yachts, um, again, there's about a 5% tariff, and New Zealand has spiked up to at least double that um, in certain years. One of the most interesting um, markets, and I'll, I'll go into this at, at the end, is Vietnam. Um, again, you've got a market that has a very gro it's similar in some ways to China, Korea, the Japan of old. You've got a really building middle class um, and upper class and more and more interest in terms of uh, purchasing high-end products. Lobster has taken off in the last couple of years, um, and even with a pretty high duty right now, with 10 percent duty, um, there's a definitely an appetite for some of our higher end food products, and I know even with the blueberry industry, that's going to be a further target market that um, some of the wild blueberry industry is, is going after. Um, paper and paperboard definitely looks like some protectionist tariffs that are being uh, slapped on there at 25 percent and not very much in terms of our exports because of that. Um, on the EU side, these were EU for the most part doesn't have um, huge tariffs on our goods and vice versa, but these were some that, that came to light. 
Um, and again, when you start talking about some of our natural resource products, the EU was for many, many years the number one market for the lobster industry. They've diversified over to <coughs> Asia now. But if you take a peek at that 20 percent and 8 percent tariff, um, and once you get a high dollar value, U.S. dollar value that we have on the exchange rate right now, it makes it more and more um, difficult. Again, uh, the yacht and boat building market, that's a significant market, traditional market for all of our boat builders. Um, aircraft turbines, Pratt & Whitney uh, has a number of sales going into Europe every year. That's, those are probably what we started seeing as some of the higher tariffs that our um, main processors were, were you know, facing when selling Europe. I will I wanted to close with this, um, and Spencer Fuller from Cozy Harbor Seafood was supposed to be here with me because he's obviously um, has a lot more experience in the lobster industry than I do. But I will um, try to uh, communicate the things that he was mentioning to me um, and that we're hearing a lot. Um, this just shows you what happened after the U.S. South Korea FTA for Maine Lobster. Um, the top line. Uh, on that represents live lobster. The middle line is um, prepared or um, frozen, but with value added. And it's basically made all the difference in terms of taking off. And part of that was um, we had about $500,000 that was sold in 2011, and then after two years of the FTA, it's up to $5.6 million. Um, the thing that's really concerning the lobster industry is that, um, and we don't know exactly when it's going to kick in, but that the Canadian EU FTA has, is basically passing through and going to go into effect before anything like this goes into effect with the um, TTIP. And our processors are really concerned on that front because it's our number one competitor. Uh, Canada, and it's going to make immediately our product 20 percent more expensive. And we're already more expensive most of the time because Canada um, sells smaller sizes than we do. We're, I think, much more sustainable, and I think that's a good thing in the long term. We have a disadvantage most of the time against, and especially right now, against the Canadian dollar, which has tanked because of it, it's so tied with oil prices and mineral prices. But then when we're starting to talk about come January that they're not going to have a 20 percent duty um, if, if it's on track with what they were saying, um, Europe's going to pretty much be dead for the industry. So um, that is what everybody has been talking about at the Brussels Seafood Show, at the Boston Show, and it's in, you know, our top three exports. So. I have a little bit of concern around that and also of, you know, staying competitive on a world market. And as I said, you know, I'm not an expert in terms of trade policy and there's plenty of things that I think um, have potential impact for us on the import side. Um, but we're very export oriented and so that's the, the news that we're hearing through our companies and what their concerns are as they're looking at the landscape over the next couple of years. So that's my closing slide. <laughs> Thank you, Janine. Any questions from the Commission? I have, I have a question. Sure. Uh, Janine, uh, no, noticing some of the high tariffs on lobster and I suppose paper products, I think it was 25 percent. With certain industries. But it's uh, interesting countries. that they want our jet engines and it's only 2.7 uh, percent. Right. Is it, some, is it because there are things they can't do themselves and they put a low tariff on it and things that they want to protect they put a high tariff on? Um, some places that can be, yeah, absolutely a policy. Um, and you're right, oftentimes people use tariffs as, you know, a kind of hidden, hidden protectionist measure. Um, and I think that also sometimes things that are seen as luxury products, which unfortunately we do have, whether it's yachts or whether it's lobsters, are, are seen as luxury products, um, they'll put a higher tariff on as well. And the other question I have, um, the tariff on lobsters 20 percent to the EU, EU right now, if 
we have a free trade agreement with Mexico and Canada. Mm -hmm. you, you don't envision maybe buyers uh, buying Amer uh, Maine lobster and reselling it to the EU with no tariff? That would be, well, first of all, it's illegal. Um, it would be next to impossible because of the uh, labeling regulations. Um, I don't see, you know, there's a fair amount that goes back and forth in terms of um, Canadian and U.S., but there's also some new regulations that are coming on um, in the next year and a half called COOL, which is really saying every uh, export, whether it's living, leaving Canada or the U.S., has to have traceability back to the catch and, and place, and that you can't, they're also talking about not being able to double label, because right now you can say cotton Maine processed in Canada exported to Europe. Um, now they're saying it's going, or if this cool regulation goes into effect, basically it's only from the point of export. So I don't see that being, and that will, it would definitely stem the flow. But I don't, you don't see that very often just because, in, especially with food products, it's very highly regulated where the source is from um, and doesn't move so easily, especially when you talk about certain Canadian provinces, if they have their own, um, they, they're pretty regulated. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Do you have any statistics in terms of um, for the study Maine students, whether when they graduate from a Maine academy, they're staying in Maine for college, and, and then whether or not that's they're making their way into our workforce, or, mm -hmm. or are they leaving when they have their degree? You want to take that one way, just because I, I don't want to, uh, this is his. Do you want to come up your way? Um, it's a good question. I mean, and this was something that when we were starting to pull this all together, um, really we wanted to make sure, this, this all grew out of a conversation that we had about eight years ago, I think, when we were sitting in Tokyo, and it was, you know, the, if the ultimate goal is that we want people to be investing in Maine, that what we want to be getting them doing is coming to Maine, because that's always our best selling tactic, is get them here and then they fall in love with the place and they want to stay. Get them to, so it was visit, study, invest, get them to come here as tourists, send their kids to school. Um, and as part of that, it was, let's see what we can do to start moving um, kids that come here and go to Lee Academy and then they go to the University of Maine and then they take a job as a researcher at, at Maine Medical Research or, or at, at Jack's. Um, what we've heard is that um, there's definitely a, a disconnect between the high school, the, the kids who come from high school and, and go to, then go on to college. The, the word that we've heard from the, um, it's not to say it's not happening, but it's not happening in the numbers that I think we would like to see. What we've heard from a number of the headmasters of these, of the high schools that we're working with, the principals are, these kids aren't coming here to go to Husson. These kids are coming here to go to Yale. They're coming here to go to Stanford, and you're not likely to change the minds of, the, of them in mass numbers that they want to stay in Maine when they do that, which is unfortunate because obviously these are parents and families that we want to stay, keep engaged in Maine. Um, so, but it is happening, and I think one of the good, um, I think one of the, the benefits of what we've been doing, what we've been able to do with Study Maine is really start to bring the high school and the higher ed institutions together in a way that they weren't really working together in the past. When we started this five years ago, we had a headmaster from a school stand up and say, I've got 45 international kids on my student and I, on my campus, and I have never seen anybody from the University of Maine here to try to recruit them. And that, I think, has, has made a big difference, and I think that's made a big change, because a lot of that has, has started to happen. And when you saw the list of, of schools that went with us to Kazakhstan, we had four high schools, we had two universities, they're all working together now, where there was a big disconnect um, between, between those two levels. So I think that's been the, the big benefit. I can't give you a number. Um, you know, anecdotally, we probably hear from each school, you know, they might have 40 to 50 international kids, probably three or four of them stay here. Um, the rest of them are, are going out of state. So there's a couple different approaches to that. Where we, want, we really want to push the University of Maine STEM education. We feel like that's the place that we're going to gain the most traction to try to keep them here. Um, Colby Bates, Bowden, they're all kind of keeping them here. Um, what we want to try to get them into also are looking at places like Huston and Thomas with professional degrees because there's a lot of interest in those places. Um, 
but you know, still a lot of work to be done on that. No one tracks those statistics. That's the problem. The, the problem for us is that we need to go back out high school by high school and say, where did you place them? Mm -hmm. and, um, and that takes a lot of time, a lot of resources. So a lot of the stuff that we get is coming to us um, anecdotally. Yeah, there's nothing, nowhere that is actually pulling those stats together for, for us, which is, yeah, would yeah. be wonderful to have at our fingertips. And maybe as this grows, we'll, we'll be able to get, um, you know, survey more and get more data mm -hmm. um, based on that. And then in terms of staying and investing, I mean, we, if you talk to places like Thornton Academy, they have had unbelievable investment from their international students that have uh, come. I don't know if I want to bring, bring up the E word, but um, one of the challenges is once guys uh, graduate college from Maine, unless a, a Maine company hires them, and I think that the Blackstone internship has been great in terms of, you know, uh, students learning more about, you know, different um, workforce potential, but unless a company sponsors an international student, they basically have to get out of town. Right. And um, one of the things um, that's in discussion right now, I know at the state level, is um, whether it's the potential for an EB-5. And that was something that was, uh, we talked about a lot a long time ago. We did some review on it, and um, we have some um, private sector driven ones, but unfortunately, they've all been pretty dormant. So it's re looking at that again and seeing um, is that something that there's opportunity in. And what that allows is that with those families who have invested, you know, um, sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars into education in Maine and then um, have established a relationship here and want to do further investment here, um, it allows for those investments to be able, if they're creating at least 10 jobs per million dollars invested, that then they can apply for um, permanent visa status or permanent resident status. We haven't had an active one um, yet. Um, I mean, they've been active in terms of establishing themselves, and that in itself is a huge expense. Um, but we're taking a look if there's anything that can um, work for here. It's been very um, successful in Vermont and a number of other states. So, yeah, that's, that's kind of our, our missing link on that front. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's kind of painstaking for the numbers in terms of numbers of, of people that it's going to grow or feed into our, our workforce. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of work for. And, you know, there really are a limited num number of companies that will take on yeah. um, sponsoring. That's why I think uh, an internship type of thing is a really great one because at least then mm -hmm. a company can qualify, you know, is this a candidate that's really unique skill set? You know, I mean, you've got these students that have language capacities of right. all over the world, and that could do, you know, a huge help to a lot of our companies that are trying to work in those markets. Mm -hmm. um, but there's got to be, you know, there's a value proposition there. Is it worth sponsoring? What's their work ethic? Are they going to stay here and all of that? There are, you know, uh, definitely IDEX has been sponsoring. Uh, Jackson Lab's been sponsoring. We have a number of different, but... Um, I would say for the small, medium-sized industries, they're not going to take on that risk oftentimes. Okay. Well, food for thought for our federal delegation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Let a uh, lock. Would it be appropriate if I asked a few questions? Oh, sure. Okay. Um, uh, several questions. Um, I guess in relation to the TPP, um, you didn't really talk about any of the possible trade possibilities with China, though I, and I realize in saying that, that China has been excluded or not included, however you want to phrase it, <coughs> in the TPP negotiations. What, what are the prospects for trade with China and how do you think their, their not being included may affect the TPP? And, and maybe you don't even want to get into that. but. Perhaps the broader question of the prospects, future prospects for trade 
With China? With China. Well, China, I mean, is, I didn't put the stats on here, but is, has grown leaps and bounds, you know, as, again, the middle class and, you know, um, their capacity in terms of, and they have become uh, much more importers uh, than they ever were before. It was definitely the first part of their rise was on the export economy, but now they've become a very important um, economy for U.S. and EU exports. <coughs> so I do think that that's going to, to um, you know, depending on all things that happen with policy and with stock markets, et cetera, but um, even with the stock market taking a huge hit over there, um, the Pro prospects we're hearing from from major banks and such is that they're going to um, continue to grow and be a growth market for U.S. products. They value our goods. They tremendously value our food. Um, they've had big issues in terms of food quality and safety, and so they're buying. They they are the number one purchaser of Ireland for baby formula. I mean, almost everything that Ireland produces that's not for a domestic market goes to China because these parents are afraid, you know, in terms of what has happened in the past. They, um, you're seeing our, our exports of blueberries, you know. I don't think that eating blueberries every day is going to, you know, protect them 100 percent from Shanghai smog, but, you know, it's another, you know, antioxidant to help them. Um, there's... Definitely um, a lot of interest, I was saying, on the life sciences side, our medical products, anything that really can affect um, kind of human health because it's an issue um, over there. So I think that I only see China continuing to grow. I think our lobster exports are up 500 percent to there um, over the last four years. Um, and I really shouldn't go into this territory because I'm not an expert, but I can say I remember in 2012 when we were in Asia and meeting with some ambassadors and them talking about, I think a lot of what we're seeing on trade, trade lays the tracks oftentimes in terms of policy and geopolitical interaction. China's, you know, surrounding areas are very nervous. You know, and I think that that's one of the things that the, you know, federal government says, let's make sure that we keep our friends close and let's keep more and more activity going, whether it's people or goods, um, to, to help them strengthen the area. So there is a whole other side of this equation that is quite fascinating and sometimes scary uh, when you hear about it. But I think that particularly, I think... Part of the reason why you see Japan in there is because uh, particularly the, the challenges in terms of uh, the two nations and their dynamic. Do, do either of um, either you or Wade know offhand what, um, if any, tariffs exist or principal tariffs exist from China with regards to products that Maine typically exports? Not offhand. Yeah. Yeah. No, there. Are, I mean, there definitely are tariffs on on um, most of the items that you'll see. Um, but I think that, <coughs> despite that, their growth has been so tremendous. Now, if they start plateauing, that might be a, a different um, scenario. But that's something that we could definitely get you, depending on what industry sector you're particularly interested in, or the top ten. Well, I guess simply the question sort of relates to, I think, what many of us hear uh, about, you know, the burgeoning uh, trade relationship with China or the, the potential for that, and then how it relates to the fact that they've not been included in the TPP um, negotiations. Though my understanding is there's probably an opportunity for them to join at some point later on. Um, I, I think I have the same kind of question about um, the improving relationship that the United States has with Cuba and the trade possibilities. I, I think I, I, I know recently I saw a news report that Senator Collins had visited Cuba and talked about the potential for blueberry exports, and I wondered if you could comment on that. Well, <clears throat> I was in Cuba in 2005 and went with a um, 
agricultural and medical products delegation from Maine. Uh, we did not organize that. It was organized by a private sector con company that had import licensing for Cuba, which is very hard in those days to, uh, it's still hard to obtain. Um, nobody knew blueberries that we talked to. I mean, that was not like, I mean, that's not to say, you know, China didn't necessarily know blueberries, you know, 10, 20 years ago, 15 years ago. Um, their demand, I, I think twofold on Cuba, their demand immediately, I think, are gonna, is going to be, um, there is definitely demand on the food side, uh, but usually you're talking about low value, high protein resources. Um, there is definitely some demand on the infrastructure side. There are a lot of things that need to change interior. I mean, I went really as a learning curve into help the companies on their logistics and financial <coughs> transactions because those were so challenging. Um, and we had some paper companies go. We had seafood companies go. We had some medical products companies go. Uh, animal hus or um, veterinary and animal uh, products as well. Casco has a huge fascination with cows, dairy cows. Just so you know, <laughs> we have had you know embry cow embryos go over there, um, and I think actually some um, steer as well. Although it may have been more Texas than Maine, but at the end of the day, there's a lot that has to get in place. And don't forget, they haven't had an embargo with Europe and the rest of the world, so they pretty much have had access to most things that the U.S. can make. A lot of the issue is an internal. Everything has to go through one agency, Allenport, which is government controlled. And until they relax and, and spread that in and out flow, and secondly, they have to have they have to have some source of U.S. dollars to purchase some of these things, and that's a challenge as well. So, um, I think that there's opportunities. Um, but I, I think sometimes the U.S. thinks there's going to be this huge rush in, you know, and frankly, they've been able to access pretty much anything that's allowed in from all the rest of the world, you know, um, except for our 5%, in. you know. <laughs> so <laughs> I think it's, it, you know, it's the internal stuff that's got to be really um, dealt with. Could I ask another question? Sure. Um, this one's a little more difficult, and you, you may, for understandable reasons, uh, shy away from talking about it. But if I had to summarize what I think this commission has learned um, in past years about free trade agreements, is that free trade agreements formerly were very concerned or focused on the reduction of mutual tariffs back, back and forth and trying to eliminate tariffs to create a level playing field. I think what this commission has learned, and I, I welcome anyone to um, either correct or give their view of what I'm saying, um, what this commission has learned is that there's been a move away in focus in these free trade agreements from simply dealing with tariffs to a question of regulation. And uh, one of the, the ways that this has been characterized is that there's been a move in these free trade agreements towards the, what some have called the lowest common denominator in regulation, mm -hmm. creating a, a regulatory field that's the same in all of the signatory nations for a free trade agreement. Some people have criticized that move because it, in, in their minds, it lowers the standards, the regulatory standards, and imposes, let's say, a lower regulatory standard on some nations that decide to agree with that. Since this commission's focus is the effect of free trade agreements on the state of Maine, would you want to come? Uh, you've commented pretty carefully, you know, or extensively about the effect, likely effect of tariffs and. Mm -hmm. Would you care to comment about this question about regulation, deregulation, that I, I think this commission in the past has been really concerned with, and on the on the state of Maine, yeah. and maybe you want to shy away from that. But um, well, I'll let Wade handle this one because he's been more involved on the CTPC side and the regulatory side um, than I have. But mm -hmm. I will, I will say that again, we don't take a a policy stance um, 
you were talking about China and why not China. I think that the intellectual property and the lack of law of the land that is enforceable is a, a piece of that. Mm -hmm. um, that they can, it can also put pressure on certain countries to improve. Um, I've been in international trade my whole life, so I'm pretty much, um, you know, have some strong feelings about it just in terms of I've seen even being involved in private sector companies going into really uh, rural or poor areas, um, doing work with them, even as they're, you know, whether I, I'm importing or exporting and seeing, you know, average wages come up, people being able to build houses. I mean, there is an amazingly positive effect sometimes on these, some of these agreements and on initiating trade. Um, I think that there's really some potential with Cuba on that because they have a, a long way to go, to go up. And you have a very, that's the other thing that I didn't mention that was very shocking about Cuba to me was that incredibly entrepreneurial spirit. I mean, people were always coming up to me saying, I've got a great idea, or I've got this product. And I'm like, wow, this is a very, the oddest communist country I've ever been to, because I'd worked a lot in Russia, you know, more towards the Chinese side of just, you know, very driven and interested. Um, but um, so I've seen the positive effect. I think, you know, you're right, and I think that's what has to be studied, and that's why commissions like you guys are important, and to look in and say, okay, well, let's look at, you know, where are we on environmental <coughs> regulations? Where are we on labor law? Where are we pushing back? Because we have the standard, the gold standard, and the EU. I mean, frankly, Scandinavia is better than us on a lot of different things, too. But um, we are the gold standard. And so I think that it's um, important to weigh those out, and I think it's really important to have that, that feedback back in uh, to Washington. I'm not sure that I have a whole lot more to add to that. I think that that was where, right exactly where I was going, Jenny. And it was, um, you know, as we've participated in this commission for 11 years or however long we've been sitting around this horseshoe in various formats, it's always been sort of the Trade Center's role to talk about the, um, or I've, it's been my view that our, our role is really to talk about the positive aspects of how trade is impacting the state's economy. Um, I've listened to hours of testimony from people sitting at that table and read the reports about the, the issues around investor state dispute resolution, states' right to regulate. I mean, I, I, I will have to dust the rust off, but I could, you know, we, we could probably have a good conversation about this. Um, but it's kind of always been um, our view that the Trade Center's role is to help inform that conversation, but it's really the policymakers' place to be taking that in and, and, and really really thinking about it. Um, I will admit in 2004 when I when the, the true believers who started this commission were in here talking about investor state we should be blowing up all the trade agreements we were very much on the side of whoa 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 let's slow down here um, you know I, my, my mind has been changed on some of these things I certainly can, can see the point um, of, of the hours of testimony that we've seen but I think it's important to, to know through presentations like Janine's and to Janine's point that there is a lot of other stuff that's going on in international. Um, and it's, it's important to talk about things like tobacco. We were talking about groundwater extraction probably, what, four or five years ago um, around Poland Spring. We've talked about a lot of different issues. Those definitely have impacts on the state's economy, but so does this. And this is a lot easier for us to, to, uh, to qualify, and this has this has direct impact as opposed to some of those other, other issues that we've talked about that may have impact. They may be severe impacts, but we haven't seen them yet. You know, we're, this we're seeing. This is important. And this side of the story sometimes gets missed around here. And I think that that's, um, that's certainly been the view that I've taken of the Trade Center's role in, in our participation and in Janine's testimony to the Commission. And if, if I could speak frankly, I think that's exactly one of the reasons that we wanted to get Janine back in here to get that perspective again. Uh, yes, Representative Sauce here. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Janine, um, can we talk about labeling a little bit? Um, you mentioned the cool um, mm -hmm. agreement, Initiative, yeah. Tara. Um, before we left session in July, there was a report that was sent out 
uh, on the wire that uh, Americans will no longer be able to tell where their beef, chicken, and pork is going to be coming from because of labeling. I believe it's out of the TPP. Okay. Um, and Canada was one of the most upset country about the whole labeling thing because they felt that their products were going to be discriminatory or be discriminated against because of labeling that Americans wanted to know if their beef was coming from Texas versus Canada or whatever. Um, how is that labeling going to to affect the, the, the cool tariff whole situation when labeling is going to be no longer, a, a, you know, it's not going to be something you can just say, I'm, I'm eating shrimp from Vietnam or I'm eating shrimp from the coast of Maine. Uh, how, how are we going to, how are we going to get around that labeling with this new agreement? I have to say, I, I haven't had a chance to study this, and I don't know if, um, you know, Jeff Bennett on a, in our office um, actually sits on uh, Food Export USA, and so a lot of it concerns food because, you know, of uh, concerns of where origin and traceability. Um, so I can't speak with any kind of uh, in-depth knowledge of how this labeling is going to, you know, change it. That just doesn't seem, something seems very odd to me about that because the, the um, evolution in most countries, certainly anything coming into the United States or sold in the U.S. or in Europe has been much more about traceability down to each shrimp than where it was caught. So, and people, you know, industry spending millions of dollars to do that, to be in compliance. So that kind of surprises me that they would let, you know, just carte blanche that suddenly um, nobody has to label. Um, so I, I'd really need to, to study it more, but I would say I don't really see the uh, FDA being, a, a, allowing lots of stuff coming in here without knowing, uh, having any traceability. There's actually an article in our packet on page 48 that, that addresses it. Yeah, so any other questions or anybody else want to comment on cool? Okay, thank you so much. You. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, and, and I'm one, as, as Locke has uh, alluded to, that has been on the fringe of uh, the worry part, worrisome parts of international trade agreements dealing with the least common denominator, having sit here since 2003 or 4, uh, and have gone through a, an awful lot of the trade agreements. Uh, you're always you got to look for the positive in the trade agreements because if you did, we probably would never have one because of the original scope of how these trade agreements are, are brought forward to us. We we get to weigh in on them, but. Even our Congress doesn't get a chance to amend and all that stuff. So I've, I've always been one who uh, has sat here listening to each different trade agreement and how the least common denominator of this one gets tied into this one, gets tied into this one. Sooner or later, it's going to be the bottom out on the least, the least common denominator. And everyone knows that uh, uh, wallboard from China is tainted with uh, arsenic and all these other chemicals and and for someone who as a legislator wants to look out for the good of people uh, and knowing that some of the agreements with Europe uh, that uh, or the leaked materials from Europe uh, are looking at they want to maintain their high standards and they don't want to drop down to this uh, yeah. I always have to say to myself well are we are we going too fast, too far, too far, too fast? And uh, I too have said on this commission and, ha and have had to say that we're looking for the good, the bad, and indifferent in in people who testify because a lot of times you hear the negative aspects of it. But uh, I always also worry about uh, banking regulations that get tied into these things. And uh, there, you also have uh, I, I've read uh, dozens of articles about nations like Russia, China, India, and some Pacific Rim companies who want to decouple the American dollar uh, from the world currency, which in fact is, is going on and uh, it isn't working as fast as far as they want to. So uh, finding these balances on all these trade agreements, I, I'm a very appreciative of, uh, of your organization and what you have done because I think we're looking at the good aspects of it. We also got to kind of look and, and say sometimes uh, 
what are the negative aspects right. because I think if we looked at a lot of these small countries that the small farms are non-existent anymore and all these uh, indigenous nations that uh, peoples that have farmed for years now don't do that because big corporations have taken over and stuff like that so I, I appreciate always your aspect of where we're going in the good that we're looking to do because we, we want to make sure that we have a balanced approach and you guys always bring that and I'm thankful for that but I'm always one of always saying well, well I think that that has its place as I said and I think that that is important as you're um, studying each of them and, re and really weighing the pros and the cons I guess our little niche on this is if something goes through that we're thinking that through and how do we how do we help our companies react to it so that we're not left behind and and what are you know basically um, getting the pulse of really the small and medium sized entities in terms of how are you guys going to get affected and what are your concerns because those those we we hear loud and clear when uh, when they have them Thank you. All right.